I did the first science show in uh, August 1975. And I'd forgotten one of the guys who was in it was called Lord Ritchie Calder. And he was an expert on energy, and there was an energy crisis at the time. And he said, we're extremely worried about the fact that we're putting all these fossil fuel gases into the atmosphere, and we think it's going to change the climate. And this is so drastic a problem. We've been warning them since 1963, and here we are in 1975, and people still haven't done it. And when I heard it, I didn't feel smug, I felt chilled. <laughs> How long does it take, Jody? Our last speaker knows a lot about climate change, Dr. Janice Luff, and she is a senior principal research scientist at the Australian Institute of Marine Science in Townsville, as you know, and a partner investigator with the ARC Centre of Excellence. She's here to talk to you about coral skeletons out of the closet. Thank you, Robin. Uh, we've all got skeletons, hopefully, and a backbone. Well, formation of calcium carbonate skeletons, or calcification, is the backbone of tropical coral reef ecosystems. They have to continue to produce calcium carbonate skeletons to maintain these fantastically diverse structures that we all love and appreciate and are just pretty cool. Now, the idea that the very formation of those structures might give you some clues to what was going on in the past has a bit of a history. There was a wonderful, totally eccentric scientist called Tingying Henry Ma, who wrote several papers in the 1930s, the 1940s, and the 1950s, and he looked at fossil corals. And he saw, thought he saw, and this was later confirmed, what he called annulations just sort of ridges round the edge. And I say he was eccentric. He measured the length of a paper by the number of steam dumplings he'd had while producing it. And he also did away with that very painful process that scientists have to go through, which is peer review public for your publications. He created his own journal. That simplified matters enormously. <laughs> Now we talk these days about big data because we can observe things in so much detail. What Ma did was assemble an appalling mass of very raw data. And this is according to a publication by John Wells, a famous paleontologist in the science journal Nature in 1963. And he said he leapt essentially from like a mountain goat from assumption to assumption to heights of speculation where few would care to follow. But his idea that corals had annual growth rates and these could be measured in fossil corals appears to be sound. Now, if we go forward a few years, in the 1950s and the 1960s, the Americans undertook a series of nuclear tests at Eniwetak Atoll in the Pacific Ocean. Some scientists went in to see what had happened, apart from blowing up parts of the coral reef, and they did, it's very serendipitous, this. They did one thing, they took a slice out of a massive coral, put it on photosensitive paper in a dark room for a month, and what they see, and this is what you can see in the upper right-hand corner here, is radioactive bands exposed in that image. That was due to strontium-90 from the nuclear tests. One of these scientists uh, was a geologist, and they were actually used to X-raying rocks and things like that. So the story from the horse's mouth is they gave the local doctor a few drinks and said, would you mind x-raying our coral slice? Which he obviously did. And what they saw was something like the pattern that you're seeing in the bottom right there. This is an x-ray positive print of a slice from a coral skeleton. And what you're seeing is a series of high density bands and low density bands. Because they knew when they had collected the coral, they knew the dates of the nuclear tests. They were able to demonstrate that this banding pattern was annual. This immediately opened the way to retrospectively me measuring coral growth rates. So you didn't have to go to a shipwreck, like in the left-hand side of the picture, to see how fast corals were growing. 
Obviously, when these, some of these corals can get to be several meters high, so they've been laying down skeleton for several hundred years. This means we can look back further into the past than we have been able to observe on coral reefs. And we can see things happening in the x-rays. When the corals are that big, we don't take the whole coral out. We collect coral cores, plug the hole where we've been, and the living tissue there will grow back over it. So we're fairly user-friendly. I just want to show you uh, two corals from both sides of Australia. In 1998, that was the warmest year then on record around the planet. It was also a major El Nino Southern Oscillation event, the strongest evidently on record. Many of the world's coral reefs bleached in response to the hot water stress that progressed around the world during that event. The coral, on the coral, the coral core on the left there, I'm only showing you the top section, we've dated it uh, back to 1830, and the core was collected in 2008. That coral lived a very, very boring life. Every year, high-density band, low-density band, and they all looked pretty much the same. The only thing that coral noticed, back going back to 1830, in you know, 178 years, was a hiatus in its density band during that 1998 thermal stress event. If you look at the coral on the right, this is from an inshore reef in the central Great Barrier Reef, Pandora Reef. That showed a marked growth hiatus as a result of thermal stress associated with that bleaching event. Both corals recovered, though it took the ones from Pandora Reef about four years to get back to their normal growth rates. So these skeletons out of the closet tell us a lot about what's going on, what the corals have experienced in the past. In the top left-hand picture is sea surface temperature anomalies for the, the tropical oceans only where there are coral reefs. This is going from 1871 to 2014. So blue is cooler than normal, red is warmer than normal. And we can obviously see, as we see with the global temperature record, that temperatures are getting warmer on coral reefs. There's actually a slight blip towards the start of the record. That was 1878. That was an El Nino event. But as you can see, as you progress, as you can see the warmest year on record was that 1998 event. And the background temperatures for the tropical coral reef ecosystems are now much higher than they were over 100 years ago. The reason I'm t telling you this now is we are currently in an El Nino event. And these progress over 12 to, 14, 12 to 18 months. They have consequences for rainfall, particularly in eastern Australia, and for various other parts of the tropical, uh, tropical regions. The bottom left-hand figure shows that August 1997, what the tropical Pacific looked like with warming in that central near equatorial region. The picture on the right there is the same warming that we're starting to see as of August of this year. So are we going to see a major response of coral reefs to this unusual warming event? Is it going to exceed in magnitude what we saw in 1997, 1998? Are we going to say swathes of coral reef bleached or even big corals like the mass of parietes on the right? I think we need to wa closely watch the space over the next few months, particularly for the Great Barrier Reef on the East Coast. So sometimes you have to look at things in different ways to find, for example, your car keys. Uh, coral skeletons are a fantastic source of information about what's going on, what has happened in the past on the reef. There's, these corals are growing, they're not being influenced by experimental manipulations, so we can look inside those skeletons and they give us histories not only about growth, they tell us about freshwater impacts, we can also sample the skeleton and measure changes in the green climate over the past several centuries. Unfortunately, these skeletons are rattling in the closet because they are telling us that we are significantly changing the marine climate for coral reefs. Thank you. Thank you.